we were filming in this village and we had to cross this giant lake to get to this other village where the family that I've been following. One of the doctors we were with said, I'm about to do the surgery that we've never done down here and you can come and film it if you want. And so I was like, absolutely. The boat that we were going to take across the lake capsized and seven people drowned. Cinema Therapy Podcast with Sam and Mitch, her, her dad. Welcome to the Cine Therapy Podcast by Inland Film Co. I'm Mitch Williams. This is episode 13. In this week's installment, we sit down with special guest filmmaker Jordan Howland. We talk about the mundane desk job side of filmmaking, Jordan's adventure film horror stories, Jordan's near-death experience filming in Guatemala, the secret to being invited to Sundance as a guest of Kodak's, and several documentary films of Jordan's. We also discuss the challenges with how we introduce ourselves in this line of work and the battle with what sounds pretentious or sad. Enjoy. Today we have with us uh, Jordan Holland. Howland? Howland. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. I knew that. It's spelled Holland, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, so Jordan um, is a director slash storyteller slash a lot of other things. Jordan, who are you? Tell us about yourself. Oh man, that's a lot of pressure. I'm, uh, my name's Jordan. I make videos like you guys for a living. Um, I've been doing it, I've been doing it full time for about 10 years. And then, uh, yeah, I've got three kids and I live in Idaho and I don't know. That's about, that's about it. That's me in a nutshell. What would you refer to yourself as a, a director or a, I mean, what? That's, it's so, anytime you have to tell someone what you do, it feels so pretentious. It does. It drives me, because I don't know what to say. Sometimes I'll say filmmaker, because yeah. that's easy for people to understand, even though that sounds super pretentious. Or I'll say a director or video guy sometimes like depending on depending on who they are and and how much I want to talk to them it'll kind of determine how I describe myself a lot of times I don't I really don't try to say what I do though because it's like my wife's a nurse so when she when someone asks like what do you do she says I'm a nurse and they go oh cool and like that's the end of it but you can't do that with with what we do like it's like oh so what do you do you shoot like movies do you shoot and then you just sound like you're bragging, even though it's not, it's not very glamorous and it's not, it's not as like cool as people think it is. I don't think so it's, I don't know. It's, and it's probably more an issue with me internally than with, no, this is, it might be an issue internally, but it's, it's definitely, um, it's definitely something that happens mm -hmm. no matter what. Yeah. And it, like, where, like if I'm in LA and you say I'm a director people are there like, oh, of course you are. Like everyone <laughs> here is, but what do you do for work, you yeah. know? And then up here, it sounds like you're bragging kind of like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a director, I'm a filmmaker, or I'll just, I'm gonna say I make commercials. That's an easy way to do That's it. That's an easy out. Yeah, yeah, here. yeah. I, in, in the Pacific Northwest saying, I make commercials. Yeah, and people are kind of like, I and get that. And they're like, okay. sweet, yeah. do you do drones and stuff? <laughs> right. That's, mm -hmm. that's yeah. usually the <laughs> yeah. second question. Yeah. I, I tend to say, um, yeah, I make movies and I'm jokingly like, I just make videos, yeah. mm -hmm. the yeah. movies. And, and then I explain, um, a little bit about what that looks like. Mm -hmm. I, um, I struggle with it too. My, my problem with talking about filmmaking or mm -hmm. video making, whatever you want to call it up here in mm -hmm. the, the PNW is that people say so is that is that is that like going well for you yeah is that yeah it, so you guys are you guys are able to like yeah it, like almost as if they think that that kind of thing's a hobby totally mm -hmm. and yeah and there's no way in god's yeah. name that you could actually yeah you know sustain right. yourself yeah, on yeah. That. so then you're you're walking that line of do i sound pretentious or 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 am i asking or are you going to start asking me if i need help yes um yeah and like i I've I've experimented with that one. Mm -hmm. The term videographer is common up here, mm -hmm. but I don't like that because yeah. the people that I know personally that have videographers are 
title on Facebook or LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I don't want to associate with that. So yeah, I will say cinematographer, and then you get this look like that right. was that was over pretentious. Right. Yeah. So fast, yeah. and now I don't want to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. It's so it's so hard. I my wife will end up telling people what I do for me because I'll I'll just say like I I shoot videos or I do <laughs> like I'll say something kind of and it's more it's more because I hate sounding like I'm bragging about right. what I do when it's it's to me it's not that cool mm. like it is awesome to be able to do this but it's not a, I, to me it's a lot of emails and and sitting in front of your computer and with like flashes of being able to do something really fun and exciting but most of it's like a desk job that is you know the same as anybody else's like just dealing with business and people and stuff like that so i have a hard time with it <clears throat> all right and that's a wrap <laughs> and that's a wrap no that is so true though um the desk job side of things that people don't don't see yeah yeah we go through i think we go through phases here where it's a couple of weeks of we're out filming a lot and then mm -hmm. a couple of weeks of coming into the office and editing all day. Yeah. And Mitch has been in a, a pre-production and a, and a, um, like a post production client management phase for a long time. So I can see him getting really antsy. It's like a lot go. of like invoicing to oh, and yeah. a lot of just like tax work. Cause we filed mm -hmm. a, a an extension through October. Yeah. And so then it's like, so did I? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then it's just like, gosh, when is this part going to yeah. end? And, uh, meanwhile, Sam's over here getting pissed at premiere for crashing. Right. I got my yeah, headphones yeah. on. Yeah. Cussing, cussing up a storm, forgetting that Mitch can hear me <laughs> complaining about premiere. Yeah. <laughs> so we have video shooterographer, mm -hmm. uh, Jordan Howland here. I like that uh, yes. video sh shooterographer um, with us, and he he is um, as pretentious as they come, right? And uh, <laughs> we want to hear more about these <laughs> these these stories. Um, so for real though, mm -hmm. you you have a list of work between music videos, commercial work, and I would say probably documentary ish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, where do you find your, your sweet spot? Uh, I don't, I, lately I've, I've lean, I'm leaning more on the documentarian side, but that's cause I had, I had a couple of music videos that were kind of ended up being nightmares. And so when I, when I'm doing a lot of documentary stuff, I'm, I'm dying to do a music video cause I'm like, I just want to do something creative. I don't want to have to slog through hours of footage. And then after those two music videos, like I'll, all I want to do is a documentary and deal with one person and and not have like a huge production that I got to like wrangle and everything like that. So I don't think I, I don't think I, I gravitate towards a single one. I think a lot of it depends on like the story that is most exciting at that time. Like uh, I heard, um, what's his name? Werner Herzog say, that when he, like when he gets a story um or for him to decide what project he's going to work on next he he just ends up working he said it's like if someone breaks into your house you just fight the guy that's right in front of you not any of the others so he's like i don't know what i'm going to do it's like whatever one is like coming at me at that time so right now it's a lot of documentary stuff um but that could change in a second and all of a sudden a music video could be like the next thing or I've been working on a couple narrative things that I want to get out in the next year or two that if things line up that could be the, the focus for a while so you never know it's kind of I don't really gravitate to any though I mean, or I'm not aiming towards one it's kind of like I like all of them so there you have so many like cool projects um that you're either currently working on or that we've we've seen ourselves mm -hmm. between um brighter night yeah and rusty's ascent mm -hmm. and then currently the legendary seeks of story yeah, yeah yeah so um i don't know where to start on <laughs> on uh 
you know, I think maybe it's appropriate. Let's just so we can tie another podcast episode to this one. Yeah. Let's start with Brighter Night because yeah. Cam Hotchkiss right. was your your DP or your yeah. uh, camera operator yeah. on that. And I want to hear some crazy stories about, oh, yeah. about this. I think Cameron told about like, did he tell you about falling in yeah. under the glacier? Yeah. 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 He said he was thankful he ate so many cheeseburgers because he yeah. got stuck. Funny well, story was... is that I don't think his wife had heard that story. Really? Until no. the podcast. Yeah. When we were up there, he's like, I don't think I'm going to tell Hannah about that. And I was like, yeah, probably not. Just say <laughs> yeah, that. probably not. There's been times where I've told summer stuff. And to me, it's just like, like sharing how my day went. And she's like, please do not tell me about what happens. Cause there's, <laughs> there's been some hairy times, but Cameron, Cameron going under the glacier was probably one of the, the scariest things I've ever, I seriously thought he's gone. Like he was sliding so fast and the glacier, you can just disappear underneath it. Like it wedged, you know, 30 feet down. Cause it kind of melts away from the, the, the ridge. So, he was sliding and I had enough time to think like watch where he goes under so that we can we can belay someone down underneath and like try to get him and luckily he got uh he got like his elbow I think jammed in he said his backpack too yeah yeah he had his full all of his gear on too and nothing broke luckily on him or our gear so it was nuts though Cameron telling that story it was it was suspenseful and and I was nervous but I got so many more visuals out of what you just told me. Yeah. Well, Cameron, I, I feel downplays it a little bit. He does. He totally does. It was it was intense. Like we were, I'm not kidding. I, I, he was falling long enough to think, there goes Cameron, watch where he goes under the glacier uh, so that we can get him. And like right before that, I had my, uh, my crampons on because it was, it was super slippery. Like the whole side of the, mountain was like ice on rock so it was like a boulder field just covered in ice and he i was like you should put your your crampons on and he's like i think i'm okay and then we were walking up a different route so i thought yeah he probably he'll be fine like we're not going the same way we we went and and then he just it just took like like he slipped off a rock but the whole thing was so slippery that he just kept going and was going fast like like you would on like a water slide or something. It was nuts. And then he just, it luckily got jammed in a rock and he it would have been bad. He said that he thinks if he had his crampons on though, he would have broken his leg. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Cause it would have caught and then it would have just like twisted his ankle and mm-hmm. yeah, it would have been, it would have been bad. It, luckily he, he didn't have them on after he fell. Cause yeah, it would have been the, those, those will save your life, but they'll also, you will twist your ankle so fast wearing crampons if, if you slip or they catch in the wrong spot or you step on a rock wrong, it's, it wasn't good. That was, that was scary. that was probably one of the most scary things I've, I've seen, but that was, if that's the kind of story you want for, well, you know, I just figured that's good. Yeah. It's uh, for people who haven't listened to Cam's story, you're getting Mm -hmm. caught up, but also it's an opportunity for me to say, go back and start listening to our podcast. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I think, for me though, the uh, it's it's those kinds of stories, and then also fo- like following you on your Instagram story, seeing uh-huh. you in where uh, where have you been in the last month? Oh, in the month last month I was in Thailand and v- uh, not Vietnam, uh, uh, Korea, and then um, Canada. So, so, like. It's it's those kinds of stories, and then like watching you on the back of motorcycles with yeah. these <laughs> with these Sikhs, like with your yeah. camera just like in your hand. <laughs> right. I it's it's when when we talk about what it means to be a filmmaker, mm-hmm. there's this mysterious aspect to it that I see in you that is just beyond fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. I guess that's that's part of the reason to have Instagram is to build up the the persona when it, when in reality it's mostly not that, but it's mostly not that. Yeah. But I think, um, I think what, what fascinates me about, uh, at least just sitting down and having a conversation with you mm-hmm. is that there is something inside of me that 
is never never going to want to do something different than just constantly tell stories yeah. with film. Yeah. I I have to be doing I have to be doing this. And mm-hmm. if and and you know to see that in other people where yeah there's just nothing else. I, for for 10 years all yeah. you've been doing is just looking for stories to tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that fascinate you. Yeah. Well, and it's I mean, I've kind of feel the same way and there's big chunks of time. I don't know if you guys feel this way, but where I have thought like, I wish I didn't have to do this because it would be so much easier to just have a normal job and make money and, you know, be happy just yeah with a, a regular life. But I've done, I've had jobs where I'm not doing what I'm doing, where I'm just managing a, you know, a youth program or things like that. And I'm, I'm going nuts the whole time. And just like thinking about like, all I want to do is go film something or, or make something. And, and part of me is like, man, I just, as great as this is, it would be so much easier just to not have the desire to do it because then I wouldn't have all of the other stuff that comes with doing this job, like looking for work and, you know, Say, not seeing my kids as much as I do. Like there's a lot of, I think that's the difference in when you've been doing it for as long as I've been doing it is the romance is kind of, it's, it's a job at the bottom line and there's a lot of stuff and I couldn't think of doing anything else, but there's a lot of times where I just would rather do something else, you yeah. know? I don't know. That's a, that's, it's a, it's a crappy place to be personally to know like, I love what I do, but I, I really don't think it's for everybody. Mm-hmm. And, and I can't be like those guys on YouTube that say like, just go get a camera and start doing it. Cause it, t- you have to be a particular type of person to want to do this for a living. And then to be able to, to persevere, to do it full time. Like there's, there's a lot that goes into it. Like you guys, I sure know, like, months where you're looking for work instead of shooting something yeah yeah and and stressing about it and i just in the last couple days i've had four jobs come in luckily because i haven't had any jobs since august you know so you're Mm -hmm. kind of there's that ebb and flow where you're like this is rough and i also can't imagine doing anything else at the same time (laughs) but it'd be awesome to be able to be like just a guy like I really wish I could just be a guy that worked at Costco or something like that. That would be so nice to not, not do this, but I know I would go insane if I was that way. Like right now I would go nuts. Yeah. I, it's interesting that you say that you wish, like I get that. I, every time I'm stressed out to whatever end or direction, Mm -hmm. I, I think about, the desk job that I had um, right. in really like seven years of it. And even though I had a blast to some degree creating on, on that end mm-hmm. um, of the spectrum um, in the software world and stuff, I, I think now I'm like, I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. Yeah. And yeah. so I think that makes the drive to like in the ebb and flow, like the drive to find work, more um meaningful is yeah because it's like i don't want to go back to that if that makes yeah. sense. yeah oh totally you know and i think that's yeah. always like in our world it's always an option <laughs> yeah it really <laughs> you is know? it's like it, it like to go somewhere else and find something um at the same time i think yeah we, we've we've had to manage that in our business of so what do we know you know it based on assumptions from previous years, like mm-hmm. what we're going to bring in on an annual basis. Yeah. So then within that, what can we write ourselves a check for? Yeah. Like twice a month. Yeah. So that we're not, when we have a lot of, a, a surge of, you know, invoices that have been sent and paid mm-hmm. that we're not like going out going and just crazy, like going crazy and yeah. spending all that. Yeah. Um, that we were, we're coming to a consistent 
that's helped us manage i think those like slower months yeah yeah um wh- when you said traveling mm-hmm. and uh had the you were talking about the mystery sam of seeing jordan out on a, the back of a motorcycle all that stuff that it it gives that like builds that persona yeah so to speak i think that one of the negative things in our world in in instagram um social media in general Mm -hmm. is that we have to promote ourselves but because to show that we're we're alive and yeah thriving and but at the same time i think sometimes while we're promoting ourselves we're actually like shooting ourselves in the foot because i think there's a lot of people out there that think that we're busier than we actually are exactly oh totally i think it 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 gets some people to potentially not pick up the phone and call yeah like oh he's uh, he's off doing something right now yeah no i totally agree yeah that's a when i when i left uh the production or the producer job i had at a another company to go freelance um I started in, initially I was very aloof about on Instagram and stuff about what I was doing and like the work we were putting out and stuff like that. And then after a while, and it was because I had seen that in a lot of other production companies where they just post sh- like behind the scenes shots of, you know, cameras getting set up and, and then you'd see a clip of something without a description. And I kind of just was basing that decision off of what, I'd seen other companies do. And then I realized, like, and I started to think like, what if I was like 19, 20 years old and just getting into this, what kind of information would I want about, uh, production and filmmaking stuff? And I decided like, I would love it if someone just laid out, like, here's where we are. This is how we do it. This is where we're going. So I, I started doing that on my Instagram and a lot of it is like, I'll post like, a pretty lengthy description of what is going on or where I am or what's happening. And it's because I want to show kind of the behind the scenes of, of what's, you know, going on in this one single shot or what really got me thinking about it is I actually was at, at, I was doing a music video for someone and we approached Kodak about using this um, camera that they had to shoot a lot of the, they, they wanted like eight millimeter footage in it. So I approached Kodak and they said, um, we'd love for you to use a, our cameras. We're actually going to do a training on how to use them at Sundance. Why don't you come as our guest to Sundance and use our cameras and we'll teach you how to use it and we'll get you set up with film and everything. So I was like, absolutely. Like, I'll, I'll totally do that. So I drove down to Sundance like two days later and went to all these parties and like had an amazing time. And I was about to post like the first photo from, that trip and it was just of the Egyptian theater, like the famous one that's, you know, everyone takes their photo in front of. And I was about to post just like a photo of it and say like, you know, at Sundance or whatever. And then I realized like, that's so, that's so lame. Like, you know, that's, and it's, it's going back to it's pretentious to be like, of course I'm here. This is where I am. This is what I'm doing. So I, instead I did this long post about, I, I'm doing a music video. I asked Kodak for a camera. They said, you can use our camera and we want you to come to Sundance and just laid out like all all of how that happened and then why it happened. Like it happened because I asked people, like I asked if I could do this music video and the guy said yes. And then I approached Kodak and I asked them and they said yes. And then that, that led to this and that led to this. And because I, 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 the point of it was to like show, like I'm not in some special club when I get to do that stuff. I literally am just some dude that picked up the phone and asked someone looked, I looked up on Kodak's website for a press release, found a press release, found whoever was on listed on the press release, emailed them out of the blue. And then they called me like two hours later. So that was the secret to that thing. There was no, I'm not on some special list or anything. It's literally just, putting yourself out there and saying, can I do this for you? And then them saying, sure, let's do it. You know? And I think that is that type of thing is so needed within production because a lot of it is aloof and like just posting a cool photo and then saying like, isn't it cool that I'm getting to do this? 
instead of it being encouraging and and inclusive you know i hear you yeah that's a beautiful story it is well thank you (laughs) i it's really cool i think that um so far i haven't done anything else for a job and really i just i picked up a camera in high school and my Mm -hmm. um my photography teacher told me to go to um the Spokane Falls Community College has a photo program. Mm -hmm. So I did running start there. I, I junior, senior year of high school, I just went to study photography at the high school or at the college. And then, um, my girlfriend at the time, her brothers were in tech and her dad was in tech and those companies had marketing teams that needed videos. And so Mm -hmm. I just asked, Hey, could I come make a video for you? Yeah. And it was just asking totally. the next person and the next person. So anytime I go back and interact with that um, college program, that's my story. Yeah. I just asked. I had a friend who I thought might I might be able to do something for, and I asked. Yeah. So to hear your story of, uh, that's so extreme. Mm-hmm. I asked Kodak if I could use a camera and they said yes. And then these things happened. Yeah. I mean, that's just. Well, that's, I think a lot of times I have a friend who's, whose dad always says like, you know, the worst thing they can say is no. If, that, if they my ask. dad said that. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 The and worst answer going. you could yeah. get is no. Yeah. Like that's, that's as bad as it, like they're not going to punch you in the face or, or ruin your credit. Like, you're just going to get a no like, or they won't respond. Like yep. who cares? Like move on to the next thing. So yeah. I, I, I don't think a lot of people do this, but I will like dig on a company's website until I find someone that I think might, I've done it multiple times with people where I've just like hunted down someone and then just ask them for something. And it kind of helps to have, uh, you know, a portfolio of work that I can show them and say like, I'm not just some, kid you know who has no experience doing this like i'm i'm serious like this is what i want to do um but i mean it i do it constantly constantly I still do it like where i like go through a website and then just try to try to offer them something that they can use at the same time get something that i can use from it too so they every company because they have instagram and facebook and social media needs uh stuff to put on on those platforms so offer them you know behind the scenes footage or f- photos they can use and nine times out of ten they're gonna they're gonna help you and and it's not it's it's seriously that easy like and especially if you're i've learned a lot of social media like uh directors are behind the eight ball all the time for content like they always need more because they're posting two times a day you know mm-hmm. on social media so if you say like i'll help you get a day's worth of social media covered they're like thank goodness because i'm running out of ideas and i need help with this and then it opens a door and then what i try to do is take that and then just slowly build that relationship until they hire me to do a bigger thing and then um use me regularly to do something so it's it's a process and it's a business like you have to you have to look at it as less like you're i don't know like you're a someone that they need to come to and it's it, like turn it around to be like, I'm making myself available for all of you, you know, like whenever you need something, think of me and then people will, it'll, it'll happen eventually. He's the guide. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we need to shut this whole podcast down because Jordan just gave away all the secrets. Yeah. There you go. And we can't have these secrets out no. in circulation. You just hit viral on the camera when you hit record and then <laughs> and then it'll go viral that's the it'll secret go viral. yeah that's all it takes <laughs> that's a that's a topic that we talk about a lot um internally mm-hmm. um what's that guy's name story brand building donald story. miller donald miller's building your story oh yeah brand. yeah and um for us we're trying to tell a company's story and we have to convince them that they're not we have to make our client, the hero in our story, Mm -hmm. but they have to make their end customer, the hero in their story. And that's been a really hard, a really hard thing for 
people to swallow. Like we've been we've been um, working with this one client that uh, they need they they want this whole brand film. We're making a whole brand film, and one day we in a meeting said, "You need to make your customer the hero in the story." Mm -hmm. And they over and over and over get, kept saying, "Yeah." So like in our hero story, I'm like no, you're the guide for them. Yeah. You're gonna help them get where they need to go. Right. And that's what's gonna sell. Mm -hmm. And they kept they kept tweaking their head, being like And they always came back I to don't it. Get it. But but we're the hero. But right? we're the hero, right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no. That's the yeah. I always say I, I always tell people your goal is to show your client the the type of life that they want to emulate. So you want them to 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 relate to your product or your whatever you're doing your movement your whatever you're selling you want your client to look at it and go that's who i want to be that's the thing i want not necessarily um and i think it's it's counterintuitive to a lot of people to to not like highlight like this is our product and these are the features and this is what it right. does and instead show them show the product in a way where it screams whatever you're trying like if you're if you're going after like someone who's real outdoorsy then you show their product being used in the outdoors and and someone using it that has it's subtle but like the kind of car that that is cool to that group of people and yeah the type of boots and the the parka that they they want to use the yeti cooler sitting by the campfire like right. all that stuff to where they're like like, oh, that's the life I want. That's what I want. And apparently if I buy this product, then I will get part of that life. And it and it says something about them. Like, if I have this, that's telling the world that I am this type of person. Yeah. I do it all the time. Like with, I have two Yeti coolers because I really like their branding, yeah. you know? Or, or North Face gear or Patagonia gear, like all that stuff. I have because I, I like what it says about me more than, you know, the, I couldn't tell you the tech features on any of that stuff, but I like what it, it tells the world yeah. about me, you yeah. know? And a lot of, a lot of clients, I, I would say bigger companies get this and they understand it, but a lot of smaller companies are, uh, companies just getting into marketing do not understand this. And it, for me, it's a, it's a constant, battle and usually i have a few f companies i work with that the marketing guy there totally gets it and is like we this is what we have to do and then the the higher ups or the guys that started the company do not understand that and are like no we got to show how this thing has these features right and how it it's the best product for, of this kind on the market or whatever yeah. instead of telling a story and making it compelling it's, yeah it's a list of like this is what it does Totally. Yeah. Uh, we make product videos for a telecommunications company, mm -hmm. and they're they're in this weird, unique spot where I want to tell a story about the product, mm -hmm. but really the customer on the other end is an engineer who just needs to know the facts, right? And they yeah. don't want the story, right? So anytime we've told a story, it's not gone well. But if we're only facts, it doesn't still kind of go as well so it's yeah. like this fine line you have to walk of story totally. and fact and numbers mm -hmm. that's that's like understanding who the customer is right. in that scenario, right. scenario yeah. though yeah because there yeah. is a time where i mean a manual is a perfect example of like right i'm not looking for a story i'm right. looking out how to yeah. install an explainer yep. video yeah exactly. yep. yeah totally yeah um so but that yeah but for the most part, you know, when it comes to, especially B2C, you know, when we're selling to a consumer, mm -hmm. you know, that's where story comes in. Right. Yeah. Right. And there is a small, like, niche market of people that they only care about the specs, especially in the camera world. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, like, the um, as of as of right now, this morning, Canon released their new... The 1DX. 1DX Mark yeah. III. Yeah. And there are so many cool photos of it and all and and everyone's post about it mm -hmm. is bullet points of the specs totally because yeah. in the camera world we just want to know what does it do what does it do yeah yeah 
And that one is that one is so hard because then we have people come in. Um, most of the time, if somebody comes in and visits the studio, for for Mitch and I, the cameras that we work with are not that big a deal. No. Um, yeah. I I was working on a lot of construction documentaries. I was mm-hmm. in dirty environments. I needed this thing on my shoulder. I needed things to be fast. I needed some buttons right here, and right. I needed XLR inputs. Mm-hmm. That's why we got. That's why I bought a Sony camera. Yeah. There wasn't really anything else that was that easy mm-hmm. um, at the time, and so when it came time for us, we we ended up liking the camera. When we needed a second one, we bought something similar. Yeah. So now we have two Sony cameras. Mm-hmm. There's nothing more to the story than that. It wasn't like it had better specs than the other. Right. One. Yeah. We've had a couple people come in just to they've found us on Instagram or a student from the falls that wanted to come visit us. They'll mm-hmm. come in and and they'll shoot right into talking specs about these cameras. Yeah. We had one guy who just started throwing out numbers. numbers. He had he's talked about the camera that he currently owns, why he didn't buy the other one and all the specs on this other one yeah. that he had in mind and then all the lenses that he might get, but he yeah. wants to sell this one, but he wants to sell this one. And I finally had to tell him, dude, you've thrown out so many numbers. I didn't retain any of it. Right. Yeah. And and I don't even know what you want to know about us, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what you want to get to know. Like, yeah, right now this is just he. Uh, he was talking about how he was potentially going to shoot a wedding, but he didn't have the right lens. Yeah, and then he was going back and forth on what lens he yeah. had, and we we're like, "What lens do you have right now?" And I think, "What do you have? Like a thirty-five millimeter or something like something that?" Something like that. That'd have been fine. Yeah, for and, yeah, that's fine. And, <laughs> and so we were just like shoot with that and he goes well what if i want to get tight and it was like move in closer yeah move yeah. in closer. yeah, like, yeah. You, until you can buy a tight lens just yeah move in close be creative with the lens that you have exactly and use it for mm-hmm. you know your portfolio of work yeah it will get you a job like, totally it will help you yeah and then the next person to hire you for a wedding take that money and go buy yeah this right 28 to yeah. 70 or 24 to 70 that you're talking about or yeah whatever. The best part about that conversation, though, is as we talked, we we uncovered that he had two weddings, uh, f- the footage for two weddings that he had never edited because they were just projects that a photographer um, asked if he wanted to do a, a film just as part of mm-hmm. um, an internship. Yeah. So there wasn't really anything on the line for him to finish it, but he just never finished them. And so we realized you have two weddings sitting yeah. there that you could just edit right now. Those are portfolio pieces. Mm-hmm. Those are um, relationship builders with you and that photographer. Yeah. Why don't you go edit those? And it was like a, I don't know if I, I don't know if I really want to do that. Yeah. And by the end of it, Mitch had challenged him, go home right now and over the weekend, edit that wedding, edit yeah. that one wedding. And send it to us on and Monday. And send it to us on Monday. And he's like, "Are you? would you watch it if I send it to you on Monday? <laughs> yeah, we would. And mon- sure enough, Monday morning, I got a text from him at, at 8 a.m. It's uploading right now. I, I'm going to send it to you soon. And then after he sent it to us, he goes, I'm really sorry. I'm, I got to go to sleep. He was up like all Whoa. weekend long finishing it. That's awesome. Yeah. Did it turn out? Did he do a good job? He was, yeah. It was good. It was good. He, yeah. he pre-warned us that um, it was all 720 because uh-huh. uh, his camera was only 1080. He 60 frames a second was 720. I was like, dude, don't even worry about it. Yeah. I just want to see what kind of a story you put together with yeah, this. Yeah, and yeah. it was... It was really good. That's awesome. Yeah, really and at the end of the day, it was like he just could not get over the the hump, like over the right, like that he had this unfinished work. He had a yeah. potentially hairy relationship with another yeah. photographer because he hadn't finished. It's like, dude, just do it. Just yeah. do it. And that seriously, that is that is uh, another. <laughs> thing about deadlines that we always talk about it's like put a deadline on the freaking yep. calendar yep. yeah and yeah. set yourself it's it's makes such a big difference yeah i the whenever i have a client that is like well oh i'm okay thank you okay. i just that who is, is like, not sam Peen. that's uh <laughs> that is coffee i'm, I'm refilling pouring. my cherry dried ethiopia <laughs> oh my goodness oh, wow. oh my goodness <laughs> from rockford roasters speaking of pretentious <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i if i have a client that doesn't have a a deadline that project will not get done like if they're just like whenever you get to it like you know i've got so many other things that i can work on if there's not like a 
like has to be in our hands by this day, then it's not going to get done because I've got so many yeah. other things that I could work yeah. on. And it's not, I wish it was different, but that's the truth. Like I, I have only so much time to focus on things and I really need, even for like my personal documentaries, I will pick a, like a film festival that I want to submit it to. And that's my drop dead. This has to be done. And it works every time where I'm getting, I'm going to get it done by then. And if I didn't have that, like I would have so many documentaries just sitting unfinished on yeah. my hard drives. Yeah. Yeah. We have one. We just have one that's sitting on our hard drives that we the, still haven't touched. The Patagonia yeah, one? Patagonia. Yeah, Patagonia. We keep, I we think keep I just saying, it. No. No, we, I went through and I organized all the footage. Mm -hmm. So if you open up the Premiere file, there's all these timelines with topics like yeah. catch, release, walking, hiking, mm -hmm. camping. Uh, so we could. We just have had so much client work that we haven't given ourselves the time and yeah. we don't know what we would want to submit it to anyway. So yeah. we've we've talked about though if we had if we if we took two days and shut down everything and we only focused on that, we could get we something could, put together. We could get yeah. something put together. Well even like for most film festivals you can submit and then fine tune afterwards. Yeah. So if you get like the skeleton down yeah. and you can see the basic elements but you don't have graphics in there or credits and the nice thing, especially with Vimeo, like a lot of festivals just want a Vimeo link, like on uh, Film Freeway, which is like the website where you can submit film to every festival hmm. that's worth submitting to through that website. Um, the, you can embed a Vimeo link on your, on like the submission page. So what I'll do is I'll just continuously, I'll submit to a festival and then keep working on the project and just uh, re-upload it on Vimeo because you can like, you know how on Vimeo you can, you can. You can re-upload up, over yeah. the same, so it's the yeah. same link. You yeah. can't do that on YouTube. Yeah, but and then like I'm constantly updating it and it's getting better and then, and a lot of times, you know, festivals will only, they'll have a submission date, but the, they won't get to looking at it for a couple weeks or a month or more. So you have a lot of time that so way to like to fix yeah, it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good I that's a first of all, I just wrote down film freeway. But second of all, Vimeo re uploading the same file over and over. Yeah. Again, that's a good idea. Yeah. Do you guys use Vimeo? No, so that's been a conversation internally for us that yeah. We we kinda need to go back and I think for we would we we might go back and retrofit our current stuff. Mm -hmm. For most of what we do at inland, it's commercial stuff and, and YouTube lends itself well to be yeah. found. Uh -huh. um, there's there's some people on, on marketing teams um, in San Francisco that have emailed us about possibly starting a project just because they rented an FS7 for a project internally and they couldn't figure out something and so they looked us up or they, they found us on YouTube huh. trying to figure out how to use this camera. Really? So I think for the for our commercial stuff, YouTube has been a good choice. Yeah. Um, but as we get more into the original content that we want to make, yeah, I do think that Vimeo is going to end up. Vimeo, Vimeo keeps coming up. Yeah, I we I at least want to put our documentary work on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then probably our commercial. Anyways, it's a, yeah. It's a, what yeah. We're gonna, it's it's on the on the task list. Yeah. And in terms of the Patagonia film, we have uh, we put two days on the calendar like back in July mm -hmm. to just go to Montana and edit and then those two days got just sucked up yeah, by yeah. all this commercial work and yeah. it really hasn't stopped um, we we're probably looking to slow down enough in the mid November range that we're yeah. gonna try to put two days on the calendar yeah good and, or yeah. you know after after you guys have your little baby girl, I'll just bring the hard drive over and yeah. But well, we yeah. need to fill. We need to finish this this before like December because of I think that's you said Mountain Film. Mountain Film's I think it's probably February first is the deadline oh. for Mountain Film. Yeah, See? but still, I'm not gonna. Yeah, we didn't need to know that. Yeah, let us. You should have oh, just no, said it's December. December, so that December we would, yeah, December yeah, that's 12th. Right. Yeah. yeah, December twelfth. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, I have a couple projects that I'm 
planning on submitting to Mountain Film, and that's my that's the internal deadline that I have. One project I've I started shooting three years ago, and has just been sitting for like a year. And I thought last year I'll have time. I was gonna get two films submitted to Mountain Film, and had time just to do one. And so then, which kind of sucked because I knew at that time like that means I'm not gonna do this one for a while. But now it's basically the only one if I want to have things in festivals this year I have to get that done and and I kind of feel like if you don't if you don't get like from for like once you start getting into the festivals if you don't have something consistently that you're submitting it's easy to get forgotten about and 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 it has led to a lot of work like going into festivals so it's it's a key part of like what I do now is submitting to stuff so cool i think you guys could do it too for sure like the Patagon- the stuff that i've seen of of that trip is pretty amazing you yeah, well, thank you yeah thank you yeah that's thank you for that i think um you're it was it was through getting to know you that we've we've really thought about mm-hmm. getting serious about that um going to patagonia to fly fish was a was a personal trip Mm -hmm. and we decided to risk taking our commercial gear that Mm -hmm. we need for our livelihood with us. And we filmed, I think, seven and a half hours is the total number of of hours of footage that we have of stuff. And and we've gone through it, and it's really cool. We Mm -hmm. just, we didn't really set out with a plan other than we're going on a really cool fishing trip. Let's film it. Um, And it's stuff that even the brand Patagonia has made films about this fishing lodge that we stayed at. So it's a, it's a destination. Mm -hmm. Um, but we've, we, we met you Mm -hmm. at your, uh, you showed brighter nights in Mm -hmm. Coeur d'Alene and Cameron Hotchkiss, who's been on this podcast, kept talking about you. And so we came out to see it. And I think we both just, we both knew, okay, we need to, we need to invest in our own. Yeah. Um, yeah, personal stuff that we want to work on because um, after going to see Rusty's Ascent, mm-hmm. uh, you talked about what it was like to make something just for yourself, something that mm-hmm. fascinated you yeah, and how internally fulfilling it was. And I think yeah. we, after that, we looked at each other and we said, let's put a date on the calendar. And then we washed over that date. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's unfortunate, but yeah. it, it is personal that's that's one of the there's like the life work balance and then there's like the life personal work balance or mm-hmm. the work personal yeah. work balance. yeah and like when it comes to having client like paying projects i mean that's first priority yeah because they're the ones that are writing your check totally um and it's it's unfortunate sometimes but um it's just it's like part of the yeah. job <laughs> yeah yeah that ha- i mean i do that all the time where i plan on i have nothing on the on the books i'm like oh i'm gonna spend this much time working on this project i've been wanting to do and then someone calls and and i know it means not getting that done for you know yeah a year or so because of that but it's i mean you just have to like there's a certain point where it sometimes i'll i'll kind of pay myself to do something like uh, like brighter night was self-funded and I, um, I had a big job come in and then I just set aside the money to do brighter night and then called Cameron up and said, uh, do you want to come? I can't pay you, but do you want to come and help shoot this? And then called a couple brands and they were on board and and so we made it happen. And especially when they didn't they didn't have to put any money down, they're they're pretty pumped. So it was it was one of those times where like I I just like sitting out with my wife and like I need to take a certain chunk of this money that just came in and use it towards that. I did the same thing. I went to Peru and shot a documentary and had a big job come in and then used part of the money from that to fund that trip because it was a story that I really wanted to tell. Um, but I mean, all that personal work like is built off of 
on the backs of like years of doing other stuff to where I could have a job big enough to where I can set aside a chunk of money to go shoot something that I really want to shoot as opposed to another branded documentary or something for a client. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's rad. The, uh, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't know in terms of questions, if you want to get into details on any other stories, I'm an open book. Okay. So, um, I, I guess I'd like to hear there, there were some things that you said, Mm-hmm. at Rusty's Ascent the the, the premiere of that in uh-huh. Coeur d'Alene mm-hmm. that I think were neat um, I don't want to uh, quote you on it directly because I can't remember the exact thing so I'll say I'll say that and then I also want to prime that I want to hear about this legendaries Seek, legend, seek Riders yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. that you can tell us the full name yeah. of that. anyways and then uh, but back to Rusty's Ascent you talked about and it was a lot of kind of what Rusty said, but the both both of you said this on stage about um, asking yourself like what is too much or like pushing yourself yeah. to like, and a lot of that had to do with you know his NDEs near death experiences mm-hmm. and your um, and your personal battle with like how far do you push yourself yeah uh, how far do you go and so. Topically, I guess that's mm-hmm. kind of what I wanted to yeah hit on. What was that like? Yeah, I so that project, uh, I actually was approached by um, Mountain Gear in Spokane about doing a documentary about Rusty, and I, so I said, yeah, I'll let's meet with Rusty and I'll just kind of talk to him. So Rusty and I got a beer um, in Coeur d'Alene, and immediately I was like, "You are so fascinating as a." human i have to do a documentary about you and then mountain gear uh decided they didn't want to do the documentary or they they were going to put their money they do like a really cool climbing festival in like nevada and they're like we can either do this documentary or we can keep doing the festival that we've been doing for years so they obviously chose to keep doing the thing that's working instead of gambling on a documentary which i totally understand and paul fish is an amazing guy that that I have so much respect for. So I, I wasn't hard feelings when he decided not to do it, but I kind of told him like, I'm still going to do this because I really want to get to know mm. Rusty and Rusty's approach to climbing is so different than a lot of people that I've met because he doesn't romanticize it at all. He's very much like, this is a stupid thing to spend your time doing and it's dangerous and it puts your family in a weird place because you could die. And then, you know, what are your kids going to do? And is it going to matter to them that you put up first ascents if they don't ever see you again? And so the more we talked, um, the more I just wanted to, it was the same stuff that I was dealing with, um, doing what I do because I had had a number of near death experiences where, uh, you know, things would happen. I'd be like, I would get through them and then think if that went, even a fraction the wrong way, I would be dead. Like I'd be completely gone. And is that worth it to my family? Like, is that, will it matter to them that I've gone around the world doing this job? If it means that they never see me again, my kids never know their dad, you know? And so that, that it really started to weigh on me heavy. And, um, and then on the same side though, I know I would be, if I was just staying home all the time, I wouldn't be any good to them either. And Rusty says the same thing. Like this is, I know how stupid this is to put myself at risk, but I also know if I don't, I'm no good to my family. So then finding that balance was kind of his, what I wanted to cover in that documentary. And I, and I loved how Rusty so much of adventure film filmmaking is triumph. Like, like, you know, free solo is a beautiful film, but it's triumph. And I, I guarantee they would have made it if it wouldn't have worked out too. But so many of those films are about making the climb and, and succeeding and, and success. And there's a few guys that I think really do a good job of, of showing both sides. Like Renan Osterk is 
phenomenal filmmaker that shows like how, the struggle of doing it too. He's got a number of films where he he's shown how hard it is to to accomplish these things and what toll it takes on your relatives and family and Jimmy Chen too does mm-hmm. that. So and that was it it was always frustrating. I still get frustrated when I go to a film festival, an adventure film festival and it's just film after film of ski porn or climbing porn or you know with no real stakes like them getting to the top or having a successful run is not it's not those aren't real it's stakes real, yeah. yeah yeah what's what's real and what's more relatable to a larger audience is like an internal struggle like am i doing the right thing for my kids like that to me is way more interesting than am i going to get to the top of this spot mm-hmm. and rusty's story was so perfect like he literally says like Everest is just a mound of snow like that's all it is and like to me that was what I wanted to show and what I was dealing with personally was is this okay like am I doing the right thing or am I am I being stupid with my time uh and through that process I learned like I need that's how I make a better film is if I can personally relate to it and and try to answer a question that I'm dealing with rather than just trying to tell a cool story um which I guess maybe that's part of like growing as a filmmaker is getting to the point where you're you're saying something that only you can say because it's something that you're personally trying to wrestle with you know that is fascinating and um were these near-death experiences that you had yourself Mm -hmm. were they doing were they like in the adventure sport type no uh the last real one i had was in guatemala last year i was filming i've been to guatemala four times working on a documentary that hopefully will come out this year um and this last time i was there we were we were filming in this village um and we had to cross this giant lake lake adatlan to get to this other village where the family that I've been following and um, I we're about to go. And then uh, we, we work with a hospital there. And one of the doctors we were with said, I'm about to do the surgery that we've never done down here and you can come and film it if you want. And so I was like, absolutely. Like that sounds amazing. So I got, you know, suited up for the surgery, filmed the surgery um, and then came out and there was a weird air in the hospital. Like it was really quiet and you could kind of hear a couple of people crying and it was very, it's a bustling place. Like it's a, especially while we're there, there's um, a few hundred people getting eye surgery like through the week. So it's, it's packed with people and it was really eerie. And then I met um, with the guy that was going to take me across the lake and he's like, there's no boats going right now. And I was like, really? Like, we can't get any boat? And he's like, no, all traffic on the water's been stopped. And I was like, that's weird. And and I said, what happened? And he said, uh, the boat that we were going to take across the lake uh, capsized like midway through the lake and seven people drowned on the boat. So had we not gotten called into that surgery, we would have been on the boat that capsized and had seven people and one of the people that died on the boat was one of the surgeons from the hospital so it was and they shut down all uh water traffic for three days while they investigated and and looked into what happened and what it ended up being is it was it's a really windy area and the waves are pretty high like they can get white caps and choppy and these boats are fiberglass um boats with an outboard motor on the back that hold maybe 30 people and so they think it just hit a wave wrong and went sideways and and people just drowned like the water is cold and it was it was scary but after that that's the most recent one and I remember thinking like if I just made you know decided like no let's go film you know let's stick to our schedule that could have been me like that could have easily been uh like the death of me and and the guy that I was with and there's no guarantee that, you know, the next time we go do something like that, that it isn't, you know? And so those are the kind of things like that I kept happening and it doesn't happen a lot, but whenever they do happen, I think about like, like, why am I doing this? Like, like, is this worth, you know, the cost of my family 
to to do this stuff. So, um, yeah, that was a that was a pretty crazy one. That was just a year ago. That was after I'd almost finished Rusty's film, though. So, yeah, that's wild. <laughs> yeah, that is insane. Yeah, it was pretty. And then the paper. The, what was interesting is like the papers there. It's a very um, superstitious area, so the papers would would like report the facts and then say um you know the spirits are angry right now so everyone should stay off the water until we get things figured out and the spirits are okay and like it was it was interesting how they refer to like the tragedies like they tie in their own culture with like uh modern journalism which was really kind of crazy to see but oh man yeah <laughs> heavy and sad too yeah yeah <clears throat> the other story i wanted to touch on is a documentary that you started working on uh-huh this summer yeah the seeks the legendary seeks of surrey the legendary, legendary Seek 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 riders of surrey riders of surrey. yeah yeah so that was so i on instagram got a message one day from a guy who asked if i ever film motorcycle rides and i said i've filmed motorcycles before it's not something I'm super good at though. And, and I was, I was kind of like not interested just cause it usually those aren't fun. It's just, it'd be I, what I was picturing was filming a bunch of rich guys on their bikes as they tour around somewhere. And then he's like, well, I want you to see this video we did last year in Alaska on our trip. And so I watched this the, like 15 minute documentary that they made of their trip. And, it was a whole group of Sikh uh, bikers, like guys with giant beards and turbans. And in media, I was like, what in the world? This is crazy. I've never seen this before. And watched the video and they're, they're, they, it was just fascinating. They were like really interesting. And so I wrote them back and said, you guys are amazing. Like, how long have you been doing this? Like, like what's your goal with this group? Uh, you know, what's like where are you going and he's like well we, we're going to be the first seat club to ever go to sturgis uh for the rally there and then i i said i'm in like i'm i'm gonna do this and so i wrote him back and said i will i want to document this but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna do it as like i don't want you to hire me to do it what i'm gonna do is uh get the funds together from other sources and make a documentary about what you guys are doing. So he was like, great. So we, that was in like February and I found a producer, a guy that I've worked with a lot in the past. And, um, we started pitching it to companies and, um, uh, investors and stuff like that and have a lot of interest actually partnered with, um, uh, Adam Carolla's company, his production company on it. And they're going to help us fund it. Um, uh, but in the meantime, I still had to shoot the whole thing. So, our go- we wanted to have all the money before we started filming and uh, the timing just didn't work out. And Ad- Adam's people said like, even if we had the money, like the the lawyers and stuff that would take, the contracts we'd have to fill out, you would not get it before you shoot. So just go shoot it, make a sizzle, and then we'll find like the right investor and make it happen. So, so I left for two weeks with them and just documented their whole ride from Vancouver British Columbia to Sturgis and then through Wyoming and then back up to, to Canada. And then uh, a couple of weeks ago I left, went back to Vancouver and kind of did the second half of the trip, which was telling their, their, the story at home, like who they are as, as individuals and what they do for work and, and all that. So that'll be like the first feature length documentary that I've done. And, um, it's really fun. It's exciting. It's also kind of nerve wracking at the same time to like, lots of moving pieces and people with invested in it that I need, need to make sure that we deliver on it. So that's super rad. It's <laughs> super rad. Are you, are you, uh, going to be editing it yourself? Or are you, no, uh, you're in a, mm-hmm. do, you, do you have an editor? Yeah, there's a, so, um, this guy I've known forever, uh, will be the editor eventually. He, he, uh, just did, um, this documentary called unbranded or unbanned unbanned it's the michael the the air jordan documentary i think it's on hulu right now yeah it's beautiful but i've known him for for years and he actually i had a uh clothing company this is probably 
12 years ago, 10 or 12 years ago. And, um, I asked him if I could premiere like his college thesis film and do like a, an event because it was like a, a cycling, uh, centered clothing company. Like we were into fixed gears and his film was about fixed gear, uh, cycling in California. And so since then we kind of stayed in touch and i will go at whenever I'm in LA, I'll try to hang out with him. And he's become this phenomenal editor that's done some beautiful documentaries and worked with North face. And, and we've, we've literally been trying to work together on stuff for, um, the whole time pretty much. And this project, I told him like, you're the editor. I, I don't care what it takes. I'm listing you as the editor. This is going to be the one. So, so once we get the funds in, then he'll take all the footage we've shot so far. And we're going to do a couple more trips to Vancouver and then a trip to India to kind of get the, the second half of the story is like where they came from and Sikhism and, um, the, 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 like the, is it the tenants, the tenants of their religion? Yeah. I think you're probably, yeah. 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 So, so it's, it's a lot of work, but it, it, everyone's excited about it that we're working with. So that's good. (laughs) That's rad. Yeah. That's rad. Well, all the stories that you shared on Instagram and and the pictures and, mm. and yeah. the backgrounds of the individuals and your descriptions. It's, oh, they were, yeah. they were uh, the most, the, the coolest group of guys. I, like I watched them get hassled by people and instead of getting mad or flipping out on them, just, just being completely cool with them and not, not in a pandering way or like they're trying to win them over. Just being like, like almost like saying like, I see you. I see you like Mm -hmm. you don't need to do this. I see, I see you and it's okay. Kind Mm -hmm. of thing. It was really cool. Like they, they just, they just are authentic. It didn't matter if you were a drunk, uh, biker in Sturgis or, you know, a, a policeman, like they treated you exactly the same and respected everybody and didn't get, um, won everybody over that they interacted with, which is crazy. So sounds like we could, all learn a lot from oh them yeah in, i in i learned so culture. much yeah <laughs> well and that was kind of what drew me to that story is i i've been dealing with like in our culture here right now like watching watching people treat uh foreigners or or refugees or just immigrants terribly yeah and like wondering like what do we do like like this is insane like i don't understand how as a culture we've we've shifted so much towards uh isolation from from where we were and that i kind of realized that's the kind of the question i had i had to ha- ask is how do we as a society in the face of this act in a way that that uh reflects the values that we have and that that's what these guys really do is they've dealt with insane things like one of the guys that one of the Sikhs that we follow when he was a uh, um in college one of his professors said i'm not gonna let you graduate until you shave your head and cut your beard and stop wearing a turban and so he went to his father-in-law and said what do i do like he wants me to abandon my religion and he, or he won't let me graduate and his father-in-law, who was Sikh, also said, shave your head. Like, you got a family to support. Like, don't mess with these guys. Just do what they say. So they all, when they're younger, set aside who they really were uh, to fit in and to make a living and change their names. Like, the main guy in the film, his name's Malkit. But whenever he wrote that on an application, nobody would call him back, even though he was highly qualified for the jobs he was applying for. So he changed it to Mike. So he most people call him Mike now because that's his professional name and he started getting jobs. And as soon as he started getting interviewed, then they'd say, of course we want to work with you because you're phenomenal at what you do. Um, and they all had to make those sacrifices to just to be able to get by in the seventies and eighties in, in Canada. And, and then they all got to this point where they're like, I can't do this. Like I'm going to go crazy if I don't, um, be who I authentically am and started growing their beards out and, and embracing their culture. And I wanted to tell that story of, of going through that and like how they 
how they decided to deal with with um, opposition like the most graceful p- way possible uh, and how and to me like that's the question I wanted to ask myself is like how am I going to do this like how am I going to interact with people that do not say this or do not hold the same beliefs that I do in a in a way that's loving and graceful and um, not at all pretentious or or yeah. or mm. bigoted yeah. towards what they believe you know yeah do you have some other questions you wanted to ask I don't really have um, I didn't really have too many questions. I I wanted to talk about Rusty's ascent, and that went really, that went really deep. I'm really thankful for that. Um, the only thing I wrote down is I liked the sound design. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I well, like most of the story in Rusty's ascent is is uh, photographs yeah. with Rusty telling the story, and there's mm-hmm. just sound design in the background. Yeah, and, yeah. And I didn't even really notice that until mm. the end. And yeah. and all of a sudden I thought back and I realized there's not much footage that you had to film. No. And, um, and yet I was locked in the whole time. And, and you worked really hard on, on the sound of the ice cracking and walking. Yeah. And, and, and it really instilled anxiety. Yeah. The whole time. That was, it was hard. I had uh, my buddy Coulter um, help me with the sound design and he kind of, I kind of showed him what I wanted and laid out like it needs to feel, uh, like, um, you're there. Yeah. Like you, you can hear what's going on, but it can't be overpowering to where you, you're not paying attention to what they're saying. So we actually pulled out a lot of, we had a lot of like sound of ice cracking and stuff like that and pulled out a lot of it. Um, from the interviews because it was almost distracting when you didn't see the pictures it was it was distracting from what Hmm. rusty was saying but as soon as the photos were up there you could add those cracks in and stuff like that and then it totally made sense but yeah it was Hmm. that's a big thing that um i try to do in a lot of those projects is is the sound designs almost more important than the the visuals Yeah. yeah Mm. It was it was a it, it was a really beautiful way um, to tell that story, and I think I I haven't I it's not often that I get lost in a story that I'm I'm watching. Yeah, and that was one that I uh, all of a sudden um, when it was over, I snapped out and <laughs> realized I was sitting in a yeah in this oh, that's, room full of uh, people. That makes me so happy because that's what I do like I I love I'll watch something and I'll think about the mechanics of it yeah like oh I see how they all right they yeah. probably cut to that shot because this is a splice together interview that's yeah. why they went to that second angle or and anytime that I'm just like in the story and I don't think about like what they're doing I I love that because yeah. I I especially like when you do this for a living you see all of the seams and all of right the, right and it drives me crazy to to be pulled out of the moment and and see that stuff. Yeah. But when I can just like watch something and just and enjoy a story, I love that. Like that's my favorite thing. <laughs> mm. My I've said this before, but my wife oftentimes will say, Tonight I want to watch a movie. I don't want to evaluate cinema, please. <laughs> so like that is amazing. We um we watched Toy Story Four the uh-huh. other night. We went we took we took our son to go see it in theaters. It mm-hmm. was so cool. I think they, they definitely wrote that story for the, the parents yeah. that were kids when that came out. Oh Our, really? Like, yeah. Um we my wife and I were locked in. We were asking our four year old to like we were aggressively asking him to sit down, be quiet. We're trying to yeah. just this was so good. <laughs> um but we watched it at home uh-huh. the other night and I have seen some different uh, breakdowns of like what yeah. Pixar did yeah. to film or to make this. And they mm-hmm. designed um, like most of the shots of Woody mm-hmm. are basically designed around the spherical lens. And a lot of the shots of Bo Peep are designed with anamorphic lenses because she's accepted change. She's, she's accepted. Really? Um, so these, they designed it to look like the lens flares. Yeah, and they or? modeled. Really? They modeled specific wow. lenses for this, and they they are open about the animators are open about what lenses they modeled them after. So like, that's amazing. They're the Cook anamorphic lenses that are on yeah 
Bo Peep. Wow. So if you, you you get this sense that Woody has not accepted change and won't accept change, but then in the end, there's all these shots of them together where it's all anamorphic. Um, oh, that's crazy. So we're watching Toy Story 4 before my son needs to go to bed mm-hmm. and I am pausing it and I'm talking about this and suddenly I realize my wife is like, yeah, our four-year-old needs to go to bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm focused on. Yeah. We're not, we'll, we'll talk about this after he goes yeah. to bed, please. <laughs> yeah. That Ooh, was, what? I'll I'll just, I think it drives my wife crazy, but I'll we'll be watching something and I'll just go, oh, huh. Oh, well, look at that. Like, <laughs> just like uh, seeing something and be like, oh, that's cool. I like how they did it. And, yeah. and I, I'm trying not to like, interrupt or like and i and i i really do a good job i do i think i used to be a lot worse at it but i try not to like say that stuff but every now and then i'm just am so amazed by what someone right did. i'm like oh wow right oh, huh. and to her it's like i don't know what you're mm. seeing because i'm not seeing the same thing but yeah let's not talk about it right now because right <laughs> she uh my wife picked a movie one time i don't remember what it was it was it was a netflix original i wasn't interested in watching it it seemed a little too dramatic mm-hmm. for me but um she's we start watching it and one of the first scenes uh is it's outside there's a person in a car it's slowly moving towards this person in the car you can hear i don't remember if you hear dialogue inside the car or something mm-hmm. but as they're moving towards the car it's raining outside you can't see who's in the car because there's reflections on this on the uh-huh. windshield but then all of a sudden magically the reflections go away and you can see them. Oh. And I'm like sinking into the couch. Like, <laughs> that was tight. And I'm running through all the way. So is somebody, did somebody just turn the polarizer or like, what did they, or is the, is the rain CG or like, yeah. how far did they go into this? And she can feel it. She's right. looking at me and she's like, what just happened? Yeah. So, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and I rewound and we watched it again and I was like, what is going on? And she can tell I, this movie that I was not interested in now suddenly I'm. Yeah. You're hooked. I'm hooked. Yeah. What did they do? That yeah. was amazing. Oh, that drives me. I've done. I'll do that with like documentaries where I'll watch it, and the the audio will be on an interview will be so clean, but they'll be outside or by a river or something, and I'm and I'm and I'll just like l- be looking for like a mic or yeah. like how did they yeah. get this audio so perfect without any like bleed from the river or a train that's in the background that you can see like that's it's it's so it drives me crazy that i can't just watch something and be like that was awesome like most of the time i'm i'm analyzing it okay so this morning i watched (laughs) abstract the art of design netflix season Mm -hmm. two the first episode is about this um strange uh artist from i think he's from denmark but he has a studio in um, in Iceland mm-hmm. and a lot of his weird abstract cons- um, uh, art is displayed in all these different art galleries in Germany mm-hmm. and LA. Um, he's very strange. Hmm. One of the interviews is right outside this, this uh, Icelandic waterfall. One of the, one of the famous ones that everybody takes photos of it's, mm-hmm. it's super wide. The yeah. waterfall is, and he's talking about, how waterfalls have influenced his art and he's standing right in front of the waterfall and the audio is clean. That's insane. And I'm sitting there at 5 a.m. still half awake looking at this waterfall like... How did you do this? How is this happening right now? What is going on? But then um, they also did... The guys who make the that show are just brilliant. One of the... The way they transitioned to the waterfall... um, something cut to black and then all of a sudden he wiped the lens and he and he pulled this rag away and threw it and he looked turned and looked at the waterfall and it was the weirdest coolest transition there's so much stuff on netflix and all the streaming yeah. service now it's it's almost like uh what's that there's there's a a theory that humans can only handle like seven options or something like that and then beyond that they start to shut down i kind of feel like i've been like that with with television really? shows yeah like you get so many so many options and then you're just like i'm not gonna do any of it yeah i don't want any of it yeah yeah and are now you, i'm skeptical about yeah. i'm skeptical about how much of it is quality yeah it's almost yeah. like if i can't find something that seems appealing to me and like it's like sometimes seems like three it's like yeah 
Uh, I'm thumbing, looking yeah. on my through my mm. remote, and I'm like, I don't know what to watch. I'm just gonna watch something stupid. Yeah, there's all these shows I've been hearing about the Righteous Gemstones oh, on dude, HBO. Mitch is all about. Yeah, it. I, really? Yeah. I watched the first episode and it was really good, but it's taken me weeks to watch any of it. But it's because I've been like, ah, I just I don't want to get into another show. And it's the first episode is over an hour, uh-huh. but all the other ones are. Are I they shorter? Around 30 minutes. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. That was part of it. I was like, I can't do an yeah. hour show like for the next seven nights. Or the eight last nights. episode might be closer to the 50 minute mark. Uh-huh. First, first it's and good. last or the longest. I, I like it. Yeah. Um, I like Danny McBride. I think yeah. he does amazing work as a director. Yeah. This is the most uh, meaningful show I think that mm-hmm. he's done. Yeah. Uh, it's a... Uh, and there's a a clear plot throughout the, the season. Yeah. Like, um, is it gonna? Are they doing a second season of it? I don't know. I hope so. They they left it. Did they? Where they they could. they could? Yeah. Um, but I mean, vice principals and mm-hmm. um, oh gosh, what's his freaking baseball? Uh, oh, Eastbound and Eastbound Down. And down. Mm-hmm. Those were those are good. Yeah, I really enjoyed them. I thought they were shows though where i could have like watched an episode yeah and yeah i just thought it was funny right even though there was there were plot lines this one was like cemented after the first episode it yeah was, okay. it took a turn yes i was like holy cow yes yeah and so that's that yeah i was hooked yeah the second that episode ended i was yeah. like watch an episode yeah <laughs> and sam sitting over here because he's he's very familiar with hbo because every single day that something doesn't work, I say, hey, do you have HBO? Because <laughs> Sam should have HBO. Our AT&T account, we have, we have free HBO with our AT&T oh. account. But, but I, uh, something, something happened when, when I don't know. Direct TV. It's, TV it's through Direct TV uh-huh. now or mm-hmm. Direct TV Go. I don't know which one. And there's an error with our, our account because oh. they added free HBO with our yeah AT and T account yeah. somewhere in there, but we were already paying for HBO. So so now there's I think error. when we took out the payment, like HBO's our account is just aired out, and we've got on the phone with customer support with AT and T, Directv, and HBO, he and says it's gone we, nowhere. He means his wife. Uh, My <laughs> wife and I both uh, have done this, <laughs> and we've gone nowhere. And so at this point, we're just like, well, we have free HBO, but we don't know how to use it, uh, and it's just out that's there. Frustrating. I just so love every time crap. Mitch yeah. brings up this show on HBO, any show, there's so yeah. many different shows I want to watch on HBO. Yeah, Barry is another one that we talk about all Barry the time. Barry is good. Barry's really good. Yeah. I watched first season. Uh, and then my HBO account had problems, and I have yeah. not. Been Chernobyl. Able to watch. Oh, Chernobyl. Chernobyl. Oh, so every gosh. time something isn't working, or or every time I have something cool mm-hmm. that Mitch doesn't, he'll look at me and go, "Do you have HBO?" <laughs> That's awesome. What about Succession? Have you watched that? I I watched half of that. I I liked it. It was it wasn't something that got me hooked though. So I haven't been like. I don't know. Someone told me yesterday about it's a uh, oh, it's the it's Chance the Rapper's uh, show on Netflix. It's like it's like The Voice, but it's just for hip hop. Okay. And they said it's amazing. And then I, on Instagram, a few people have posted about it, how good how good it is. And I don't. I used to feel like oh man, I gotta watch that now. And now I just get a little bit of anxiety or like, Oh, when am I going to have time to watch? Yeah. You know, it's a weird, it's a weird, I don't feel like when there was only so many cable channels, like, and you would DVR something. I never felt that way. Or, or when a movie came out, when a movie comes out now, there's very few where I'm like, I'm going to go see that. Like most of the time I'm like, Oh, I got to make time for that. Maybe that's just being older. I don't know. I'm kind of a curmudgeon, I think on a lot of stuff. I hear that. I like I like when I can get into a show and I just have to watch all of it. I personally think I enjoy shows more when they release every week. Yeah. Now. Yeah. I totally. I, I can do the binge of Stranger Things. Like. Yeah. I'll do that, but I like following a weekly schedule because yep. then I know that 
Wednesday night for however many weeks it's Handmaid's Tale. Exactly. Yeah, and you're like, anticipating yeah. it. Sunday night for however many weeks it's Succession. Yeah. Right. And whatever. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. That's how. And then totally. I'm not, yeah. and I don't get the anxiety of like, what show do I watch? Tonight? Yeah, yeah. I, it's I know this one's on. Yeah. at this time. Yeah, that, that that's where I feel old school. Yeah, yeah like, totally. This. Yeah, that was like, uh, uh, what show was it that? Looming Tower. Have you I seen that? Know, but that was a Hulu. Yeah, think, yeah, yeah. And that one I got into, and I would wait for it to post every. I think it was on Sundays. And my wife watches um, Handmaid's Tale and I'll watch it whenever she's watching it. But I don't really, I haven't watched all the seasons of it, but that's another one where mm. when it's on, I'm hooked. And it's more, it's more, that one's more for the cinematography. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That show's it's, amazing. It's phenomenal. Yeah. I love that show. She, my wife actually was like, you should watch this just for the cinematography because you would go crazy. Yeah. Okay. I think one, one of the other aspects of, of shows releasing every week is, is the, the community Mm -hmm. um, interaction around it when I can get into a show with our kids too that's the best and they're like mm. like I they didn't watch the first season of Stranger Things before I did and then when the second one came out we all stayed up until midnight when it released and then watched as many as we could in a row and then did the rest in the morning like it how was, old are your kids now I have two 14 year old boys and then an 11 year old Gosh. daughter so they're yeah. full on teenagers which yeah. is fun age <laughs> i do remember getting into shows as a as a whole family oh yeah um we're not there yet with our with our toddlers it, we have to really get into ferdinand or or toy story or something <laughs> yeah. that's like yeah i i have to get into this because i'm gonna have to watch it 10 times yeah but i i remember how special it was to yeah. to sit down and for um for me it was the office oh yeah yeah or lost we watched yeah. lost as a family yeah yeah that's our boys just started getting into the office and they're like into it. And w one of our uh, Gavin, my son, Gavin, he, the other day was like, I feel like I understand so many jokes now that people have been saying for years <laughs> that he just didn't, that are like office references yeah, that he yeah. had no idea were office references. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And you don't realize how oh my much gosh. impact the show has on culture until yeah. you don't, you don't understand like what uh, assistant to the regional manager means until you know, and then you watch it like, oh my gosh, that's why people say that one. Yes. I love it. That is so great. Who who would you consider like your favorite director or like who do oh, you who, man. like directors, plural is fine. Yeah. Favorite movies. Oh, that's so hard. There there's so there's two films that I always go back to and I watch at least at least once a year. Um one is it's a wonderful life is one of my favorite films. I think it's beautiful. And there's, there's a couple of scenes in that, that on their own, if it was a short film, I feel I could win an Oscar just for that sh scene. Um, but I love, I love that film. And then, uh, Iron Giant by Brad Bird is another one. That's, I, I love it. It's beautiful. It's like, a an animated one that okay. was done in like 99 yeah. yes yeah I, I was wondering if i was thinking of the same yeah yeah Fair it's one of my favorites yeah so those those are always near the top and then the the rest of the list it Brad Bird changes did, uh incredibles too. yeah 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 really? he's amazing he's, and he's the voice of um aunt uh uh edna auntie edna oh mm. yeah yeah he he's from calspell montana really too. yeah originally no way. yeah okay. i think he moved when he was in grade school or high school yeah but he's originally from Kalispell that's wow awesome. yeah but yeah he the, the those two stand out directors that I love Spike Jones. Mm -hmm. uh I grew up skateboarding so I w watched all of his skate videos when I was younger and then just kind of anything he put out any music video or anything I would watch and and he's someone I I love his work Werner Herzog is another person that I I don't love everything he puts out, but the choices he makes, I really like. And, um, he kind of does the same thing where he deals with, uh, he uses a story to, to dig into like a bigger existential crisis that humans have, which I really, I really like that type of storytelling. Steve McQueen. I really mm -hmm. like a lot. I think he's amazing. 
there's like so many the, the current steve mcqueen yeah yeah yes. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. there's you that's know, true <laughs> yeah just love those car yeah, crashes yeah and, yeah <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I loved widows yes i did too yes. and i did i started it and didn't know it was a steve mcqueen film yeah i thought it was going to be like an action film i was on a plane and was like this looks interesting and and started it and then was like holy cow this is really mm. good and mm. not not really what i thought he would do like not it did not look like a steve mcqueen film mm. at all but it was a the one in um in ireland that he did the is it hunger or it's about like a uh, hunger strike the irish the ira or the the prisoners of in england that were part of like trying to break ireland from uh united kingdom and they did a hunger strike and there's one scene with um uh what's his name um oh man he plays he's in the x-men he's like shoot what's his name great british actor but he he and he's been in a lot of his films but it's like a 14 minute single take where it just pushes in on this camera on on this table that he's sitting at with um uh a priest and they're talking and stuff it's a single take though and the scene is like amazing it's called hunger hunger yeah and michael fassbender michael fassbender yeah yeah. i have not seen that film oh it is brutal it is brutal but yeah that that he he's a director that i just i love a lot of directors i love i love like parts of what they do more than like their canon of work like i'd rather i like a lot of the choices he makes story-wise and camera-wise and uh spike jones Spike Jones, I like a lot of, he has a short film that he did a few years ago about a robot that is dating another robot and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful like analogy of like what it means to love someone, but and it's only like 14 minutes long, I think something like that. That's amazing. So I'm trying to think of who other directors that I, I really like their work. There's so many like, did he direct her? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I haven't. I still haven't watched that film. That one's amazing. Too. I want to see it. He's I, really. I hear he, it's very uncomfortable. Yeah, and and that's the thing about a film like that is I I can get into them, but that's one of those things at night. Am yeah. I am I willing to? Yeah. Put myself in that headspace right now. Totally. <laughs> right? There's a, yeah, and there's a few directors like I'll, uh, I'll watch what they do and then, but I. I have to be in the right mood for it. Like I can't remember the name of the guy that did Hereditary, but we were just talking about. We, it don't, we don't have to talk about. I have not Ari, watched Ari, it. Ari, really, Aster. Yeah, Ari Aster. Oh yeah. man, or Ari Aster I, or whatever. I yeah, Hereditary. Um, I watched it with a friend. I was really excited to watch it, and I and I really liked it. Did you mm-hmm. watch that? Film? I liked it. Yeah. I I grew up. Um, my dad and my brother are really into horror. Mm-hmm. Um, they've always they've always really liked horror films and they talk about it and I've never really gotten into yeah horror films but yeah. I but I've watched so many that I I'll I'll check something out and I think Hereditary was a good marker for something that's new totally in yeah in that world and it was nothing was jump scare Mm-mm. it was really just like gut churning yeah oh that the scene after like the the spoiler inciting alert. incident spoiler alert yeah. mitch, mitch still it. can't decide if he I will or care. will not you ever should watch you it. should see it as, a, not as a filmmaker a, i just don't enjoy horror. how about we yeah. just her. forget her. about the rest of what we have today let's go watch the film it's 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 intense but they how they hang on the kid in his bed like and and you hear what's going on off camera for forever like it feels like it's such a long scene and that's where the tension is you're like oh my gosh i just want out of this moment you can't see yeah you want to like get away from like the horror that you can hear off camera but he just stays on it and that's what makes it scary and then and then they just cut to like that scene yeah like where you 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 see what you think has just happened but you have you don't really know yeah The, the one thing with his films like i watched midsummer too yeah wasn't crazy about that and i feel like a lot of what he does is like uh he tries to be brutal or or 
uh, gratuitous to, to scare you or to shock you, but it's really easy for that to almost be humorous. Like if it's, if it's done too much or, or right. weird and the right. end scene of that film kind of goes there where you're like, this is not, this is a little cornball. It's not really scary. Like the theater I saw it in, there was people laughing like at the end. Really? Yeah. That's see, I did my, my dad is a, is an interesting, uh, marker for me to know, like, I, I can I can gauge that kind of stuff. Yeah, that is one that my dad would laugh yeah. at verbally yeah. in the theater. You can yeah. hear him in the back. I I only watched Midsummer because Mitch told me that he watched it. Oh really? But I didn't watch it. He didn't actually did watch it. it. No, I was uh, over. I thought he would. Catch he on looked to up. My joke. No, no, no. <laughs> Mitch, Mitch, look. Mitch copy pasted a tweet from some somebody who uh-huh. he respects in the film industry. I don't know who it was. He copy pasted a tweet and texted it to me. Yeah, it was like his opinion on the movie. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sitting in bed with my wife. Like, look. That's Mitch awesome. actually watched it. Are you kidding me? So, and I, I had to, I think I had to fly, uh, I had to fly to Chicago the next day. So I downloaded it on my computer. Yeah. Like, I'm going to oh, watch you watched this on tomorrow. a plane? Yes. Oh man. I knew what I was getting uh-huh. into. Yeah. I knew what I was getting into when I watched it on a plane, but I, I just, I was, I watched it knowing that Mitch had already seen it and Mitch right. doesn't like horror films. Yeah. Oh. And to know that Mitch had something positive to say about it. I, yeah. I, I, I was going into this. That's crazy. This is a really good film. And then as it's progressing, all I'm thinking in the back of my mind is, I can tell you exactly how this is going to go. Yeah. Every step of the way, I know what's next. Yeah. Mitch and I talked about this uh, yesterday. He asked me about that film, and it just suddenly I I shot into an aggressive irritation about this film. And I talked Mm -hmm. about the whole thing. And I was mad yeah. that it was that it is what it is. Yeah. And and in the end of it, Mitch said, "Well, don't you think that maybe that's that's, that's the, art the point? Piece. That's the point. Yeah. You like, I, will you keep watching? You know, totally where this is going to go. I think that's. I guarantee that's what he's he's doing in that because like there's like when you know they're they're showing slow motion footage of an old man's head being smashed with a bat like over and over and over again. It's almost challenging you to like turn this off. Like, are you going to turn it off? Or are you going to turn do it, it off? Yeah. I, in y- you kept pointing out, I haven't, I still haven't watched the film, but you basically told me start to finish how it went. Yeah. And you kept telling me that he would give you a major clue mm-hmm. ahead of time of like where things are going to go. And, and you would always look at the people on screen being like, how do you not know this is going to happen? Yeah. And, but he, he knows that, you know, it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. He, the, the He's writer, giving you director, enough of the pieces. And so you are, you are making the decision for yeah. it to happen. Technically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what, um, it's, 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 uh, taking it one step fur- further than Hitchcock. Yeah. Um, you know, Hitchcock with the yeah. the carry the you knife didn't, and you it, didn't actually you, see you killed her. Right. You stabbed her. Yeah. Um yeah. and because all you saw was a a a shadow. Yeah. Or a silhouette. Yeah. Right. Um, you didn't you never actually saw Yeah. Anyways, and so it's you the audience killed. And so technically you as the audience You're staying member there. of the audience, you, you chose... took the bat to that yeah. head. You so, you pushed the the 70 year old 72 year old man off the cliff. Yeah. By because all you had to do was close that computer on the airplane. <laughs> right. And it never would have happened. Yeah. Yeah. That is true. There and there was like when they went up on that cliff, I was thinking the same thing like how do they not know what's going to happen? Like they've they've led these people up to the spot and they're all down below like obviously this is going to happen, yeah. you know? And then, and then as it progresses and everything goes on, I, the, the whole, like you, there's no, no part of it where you're like, like, Oh, I wonder if they're going to get out of here. Like, I never thought that. No. <laughs> I, yeah. See, or even like how is... they, how the parents died at the beginning. Yeah. Like t- that, that to me is ridiculous. Like you don't need to show all of that horror beforehand or yeah. the the sister dying yeah like you don't need any of that to set up that she's hurting or mm. you know like 
like he he does that with those films like like basically it's almost the opposite of Hitchcock in a way too where Hitchcock the horror is off camera yeah. so that it's scarier in your head and he will literally show you the girl with vomit around her mouth who's dead with exhaust taped to her face almost like like showing and then linger on it forever and yeah, almost like challenge you, you to challenging you to keep looking yeah yeah or turn your head away i yeah i that's why so i don't want to watch these films <laughs> but mm-hmm. you will you you still may watch hereditary because <laughs> yeah. that's we still I, have hereditary is a different like like yeah it's a different beast i i really liked hereditary and i thought he what he did there was it was a little more reserved i think than than midsummer and definitely and some of the things he did with like scares in camera were like like there's a scene where it's a dark room and all of a sudden your eyes adjust as you're watching it and you realize like someone's in this room that's been there the whole time but you just haven't you been able to see this, yeah. oh and it's the best it is the best like th- things were done in that movie where were like the main the big scene i literally was like oh my gosh oh my gosh and that never happens yeah, in a, in a horror film, especially. Oh yeah, it's in in, and I even I talked to Mitch about both of those films. Even um, even in Midsummer, his editing or the, his choices of editing yeah. are are very um, intriguing. Mm-hmm. The way that he makes, especially in Hereditary, the way that he builds up and builds up, and then even there's like loud sounds, and then it yeah. cuts to something quiet. It's jarring. Yeah. Even if no, like nothing scary happened, but it's still jarring the way that they it's visceral. made that cut. It's yeah. visceral. And yeah. and I think that's a quality for Mitch and I want to make um, original uh, narrative content. We've mm-hmm. we've we will mostly dramas, nothing that's horror, nothing that's yeah. really comedy, but like um I think when we talk about the the stories that we'd like to tell when we're writing scripts, when we're when we're writing down ideas for these films we'd like to make um, those are the things that really inspire us. Those, yeah. those um, like Sam Esmill mm-hmm. in Mr. Robot or in um, yeah. Homecoming. He de- he's that's not horror, but he still does this. Like a song will play very aggressively, and then all mm-hmm. of a sudden it cuts to silence, and you're in the next moment. Yeah, and I think those those things in Ari Aster's work are just yeah. Um, those are the things that I'm taking away. Mm-hmm. Is my inspiration yeah. for what I like to do. Yeah, we're sitting down working on on um, commercial client work, and those are our inspirations. Totally. Well, that's why I told Cameron. Cameron, it, what when we met, he wasn't really a a cinephile. I would say, yeah, like he he knew a lot of uh, like ski Outdoor, films. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I I still tell him like you need to watch uh, documentaries and films that have nothing to do with with this because that's going to inform your storytelling way more than yeah. copying the the shot styles of yeah. you know Warren Miller or something like that like you need to have those external influences i barely watch adventure films or action i i don't really like them like mm-hmm. for the most part if there's a story there i'll i'll engage with it but otherwise i'm not going to sit down and watch a new snowboard video or agreed yeah it just doesn't appeal to me mm-hmm. but i'll watch all day like a good movie or a good documentary or a good show and then pull ideas out of it that I can use in my own stuff. Like a lot of the shots actually in, um, in Rusty's ascent came out of like, uh, what's the documentary? Um, Oh shoot. Uh, the country, the, 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 it was a Netflix series. Wild country. Wild wild country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The way they shoot their interviews like yeah. change the way I do yep. my interviews. Yep. Yep. It was, it was amazing. You, you, uh, told Cameron to watch that. And then on the podcast, Cameron told us to watch that. And then oh, really? now that's the, that's our, I think that's our basis for, um, like we just finished a project for, um, the Arc of Spokane mm-hmm. and we sat down with this, this, um, mom and dad of a, of a developmentally disabled individual. And, we walked into their living room. They're in this little beautiful little house on the South Hill. Mm-hmm. And Mitch is talking to mom and dad and I'm looking around like, all right, wild, wild country. Yeah. We yeah, don't have we, anamorphics. We mentioned but wild, wild country to each other. So. Yeah, yeah. Where are we going to sit them? Exactly. Dead center with this like yep. abstract kind of framing in the background. Yeah. 
side lit, really soft. Yeah. Like we're, yeah. That's, that's been kind of the, 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 the huge inspiration for most of our, um, interviews mm -hmm. lately. Yeah. Well, and that's, I feel like with, especially with like when you do a lot of like branded content, it's so easy to fall in a rut of let's set them on the left right. side or the right side, have them right. look across like everything looks the same, light them exactly the same. And then to me, like it just doesn't, it doesn't set it apart at all. Right. Like you, and I, and I, I think the same thing's going to happen. Eventually we're going to say like, we got to stop making every interview look like wild, wild country, <laughs> you know? And yeah. then, cause it'll get used to a point where it's ridiculous. Right. And then people will say like, just shoot it normal. Like just shoot it. And then that'll be like the, the cool thing to do will be that. But for right now, like it's, I, th I think if you can use it and make it look interesting and compelling, like, like it's so much better than, than trying to do, I don't know, just doing interviews. I, nothing drives me more crazy than a conventional interview. Like yeah. where it's. Oh man. That's that, that back to, um, abstract the mm -hmm. art of design that episode one of the things that this this um artist did mm -hmm. he does a lot of of conceptual art with mirrors mm. um and so he holds up a mirror and he says for instance and he holds up a mirror and suddenly you see the red camera and the yeah, yeah, yeah. director sitting there he goes this is constructed i'm sitting here this background, they like picked this, it's neat. And he like holds the mirror and he like turns the mirror around. You see the light, you see all these people around and he's really? like, this is all constructed. And then he places the mirror back down and he goes, we're making a piece of art right now. And when he, I mean, he, he kept breaking that fourth wall yeah. in a way that made me for like, I don't care how this interview was done anymore. Mm -hmm. All I care about is what he's saying. Right. Yeah, and and it connected kind of to one of the pieces of art he, he did, one of the art installations he did. He found this this yellow light mm -hmm. that was designed to remove all color from what you were seeing. Hmm. And it fascinated him that in a dark room, he could turn on this one yellow light and everything was monochrome hmm. and it was super trippy. Hmm. And so this museum had asked him to do this art installation in this room and he put these yellow lights in. When you walk in, everything's monochromatic. And that's all he did was just a big empty room with those lights. Crazy. And the museum director was like, can we like maybe like put a red rose in there and trip people out with the fact that it's just a black and white rose? And he goes, no, then it's about the rose. I don't <laughs> want it to be about the rose. I want it to be about the fact that you walk in there with another human being and you're staring at them. They're black and white now. Yeah. It's not about the rose. Right. It's about your experience in this space with yeah. another person and the fact that the color has been removed. That and now you're looking at them differently. So he, he had to convince the museum to let him just yeah. change out their light bulbs. <laughs> in this room wow. and that's the art piece. Yeah. That's amazing. I got to watch that now. Is that the second season? It's the first episode of the second season. Okay. I'm going to watch that. Yeah. That type of stuff. I I uh I did a music video a few years ago and actually I met with a musician in town and he said he wanted to do a music video where the light went around him the whole time and we ended up not doing the music video but I I always like filed that away like oh that would be really interesting if like the shadows on your face are like constantly changing, like as you're yeah singing the song or whatever. So when I've we seen this done, yeah, we did it. It's it was a he had some examples that he sent me a long time ago, but we we bought a bike wheel and then had a C stand and clamped a light to the yeah. bike wheel and then clamped one on the opposite end so it was evenly weighted, and then we would just spin the wheel and the light would go around and the camera was in front of that so you wouldn't see yeah. any of the, like the spokes or anything. And then we just spun that around as he sang the song. So like the shadows on their faces are like constantly shifting, but it totally changed the feel of, yeah. of those songs. And that was, we did it. We, me and the DP that helped me with that part of the music video, we shot in the desert in California and we'd go into like a, a bar, like in the middle of nowhere. And we had a light bulb uh, with an extension cord and we didn't have the, set up for the bike and everything and we would just like swing it around and it was so cool it, and you could see on their faces like the distance changing like the light yeah shifting and it it made it real eerie and kind of like weird to look right. at but that type of stuff like that's so I, trippy i feel like a lot of times now because there's so many tools inside a computer that you can use people forget 
those like camera Practical. tricks. Yeah. And and then if you can figure those out, like that light, yellow light, or, you know, changing the light on someone yeah. or, or like when we did brighter night, like shining led lights into the glacier that change colors like that'll, those kind of practical things add so much value to what you're shooting yeah and it'll make it look like you have a huge budget when really it's just a bike wheel with a right. led light on it you know i love i love seeing those um those viral behind the scenes yeah uh, totally clips that'll float around like yeah a car how you shot this car scene in a studio where there's people like yeah flagging lights yeah in the background yeah. and like fans everywhere oh, yeah, and yeah. there's just this massive ridiculous production going on and it was all just to make it look like they were moving yeah, in the car totally. somebody somebody had a, a two by four underneath the car with a little like a lever and they're like moving just the moving car it. slightly so it looks yeah. like the car's bumping that stuff it's so fun when like i've done a few things where we've had to do practical things like that and and in the moment you feel so ridiculous and then it ends up on camera it looks legit but yeah. at the moment you're like this is so stupid what we're, is going on we're just playing pretend like this whole thing is we're fake. just playing pretend yeah <laughs> oh man we're all just playing pretend yeah <laughs> all the time all the time all the time <laughs> um i think that's a good note to end on that's a really good yeah note to end on. it's all pretend yeah. <laughs> it's all pretend this whole podcast was pretend <laughs> and our careers are pretend. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the very last scene of this podcast is, you know, we're in Arkham Asylum talking to. Oh, that's there. Another, we go. Have you seen Joker? Yeah. Not yet. Dude, oh man, I want to see it. Okay, we're done. Thank you for listening. The Cinetherapy Podcast is produced by Inland Film Co. Special thanks to Jordan Hallen for joining us for a conversation on this podcast. We hope you watch his films and get to know his work. If you are interested in connecting with Jordan, we listed his social media accounts in the description of this page. That's a wrap.